I'm Sarah Kenzier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent, available for pre-order now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine, a film the Kremlin doesn't want you to see, so be sure to see it. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. Welcome to our special spring series, Gaslit Nation presents Rising Up from the Ashes, Cassandra's and other experts on rebuilding democracy. Our bonus episodes, available to Patreon subscribers at the truth teller level and higher, feature our esteemed guests taking the Gaslit Nation self-care Q&A. So for fun ideas, sign up to hear that. Joining at this level also gives you access to hundreds of bonus episodes on topics in the news today. We'll be back with our regular episodes in July. If you're signed up anytime between now and then at the Democracy Defender level or higher on Patreon, you'll get special access to watch a live taping of Gaslit Nation over the summer. More details to come. This interview was recorded January 7th, 2022. Today, we're joined by two experts on the front lines of fighting for our democracy on the all-important state level. As you're always hearing on this show, if you want to fight for our democracy and prevent the slide into authoritarianism, clean up your local state government. Walking us through how to do that, including explaining the gerrymandering crisis in America and what to do about that, we're joined by wonderful, wonderful The States Project, and and their experts and representatives are Melissa Walker, who is in her other life, a widely read author for teen novels and the head of Giving Circles for the States Project, and Aaron Kleinman, the director of research. Please, please, please check out their group, support their work, the States Project. <laughs> I know I, I sound very um, determined here to get everyone to you know pay attention to all this, but it's because we cover a lot of heavy topics on this show And there is hope, there are solutions, and those solutions are with groups like the States Project. They are a group that focuses on winning governing majorities in the states. Our state governments determine the all-important quality of life issues, from clean water to strong public schools to voting rights. Trump and his big lie army are targeting state governments with the hope of suppressing the vote and ensuring that their coup is successful next time. In 2022, it's all hands on deck. Melissa and Aaron of the States Project are here to explain how we protect our democracy this year and beyond. Welcome to Gaslit Nation, Melissa and Aaron. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. And Melissa, I must point out, this is your second time on the show. I learned a lot last time you were here. Thank you so, so much for the important work you both do. Absolutely. All right, so questions for you both. Why are state governments so critical? in the fight to protect our democracy. Like I'm always harping on about this, but it's it's important to repeat it again. And then we're gonna go into a deep dive on where we are currently with our state governments. Sure, well, I'm happy to kick that off because I really am someone who came to discover the power of state governments kind of late. Um, I will admit that before 2016, I did not know who my state representatives are and was not tuned into what was happening in Albany, my state capital, even though it affected my life so much. So what I started to understand after 2016, when I was looking around for the best possible way for me to plug in and take action, was that everything that I was worried about and everything that I cared about was being decided in state capitals. And that meant all the kitchen table issues, like education funding, um, climate change, choice, healthcare, um, those types of things, civil rights. These were all laws that were being passed in state capitals, but also there were huge power issues, federal level power with things like voting rights and gerrymandering, which I know we're going to talk more about today. I started to see that these state capitals were incredible power centers and places that if we could focus on them, we could make change at the foundations of our democracy as opposed to from the top down. And that's what really drew me in to working on state legislatures. 
Karl Rove, as you pointed out the last time you were on the show, engineered a massive push to take over state governments during the Obama years. He was so successful that Republicans came dangerously close to controlling so many state governments that they could have called a constitutional convention to edit our Constitution, a far-right dream, of course. With the blue wave under Trump, Democrats pushed them back and increased their power in the states. What's the current landscape like now? How are Democrats doing? The project on the right to take over state governments dates back decades. It actually dates back to something called uh, the Powell Memo, which I don't know if you talked about on the show before. but Yeah, so um, uh, Lewis Powell, who later served on the Supreme Court, was uh, the general counsel of the Chamber of Commerce. And in, I think it was 1970, he wrote a memo basically laying the groundwork for how the far right could take over the country because it was in the middle of kind of a post-war liberal consensus. And he said, there are three main ways that we need to take over this country. One, we need to build our own separate media organ. Two, uh, we need to take over the judiciary. And three, we need to take over state legislatures. So, uh, you know, that memo became kind of, you know, really the new right, especially led by people like Paul Weirich, really uh, followed uh, the lead of that memo and built organizations like ALEC, uh, which over decades really built up this massive right wing infrastructure to support candidates who would support their political project. And there was just never anything like that uh, on the other side, you know, really kind of trying to represent the people of the country um, until really after, you know, 2016. Um, I think a lot of people took a hard look at where we were in terms of state legislatures and saw just how far things had fallen away from really, uh, you know, having lawmakers really representing the interests of the country. So, yeah, there, and, you know, so we were started in 2017 and, you know, we have been able to push back a little bit, but, you know, we're also pushing back on 45 years. You know, they have a 45 year head start on us more or less. So when did the Powell memo come out? I think, I believe it was 1970. You had kind of new right uh, luminaries, I use that term loosely, like Richard Vigory and Howard Phillips and Paul Weirich really kind of uh, read that. And and also um, Phyllis uh, Schlafly as well, mm. especially during the fight over the ERA, they really saw uh, how important state legislatures were. Um, and so, um, yeah, so like they've, they've more or less had a 45 year head start on us. So we've been able to accomplish a lot in the past few years, pushing back on that 45 year head start. But, um, you know, they still... You know, I think in I, every uh, swing state uh, legislative chamber is still controlled by Republicans. If you look at kind of the six closest states in the 2020 election. Wow. But the, the, the good news is that the margins there are incredibly close. And there are states where really if just a few hundred or a few thousand votes had flipped, Democrats would control a chamber. Um, and so we're dealing with really tiny margins. We're dealing with really kind of inexpensive races. So if you want to think about, you know, how can I save democracy? State legislatures are really where kind of your resources go the furthest. Right. The return on investment is is really high. Um, So 2016 was a wake-up call on so many fronts, especially how Democrats seem to be caught off guard by decades-long efforts like the Powell memo. Um, What have Democrats done, if anything, over the decades to address this right-wing onslaught on our democracy? There was a very D.C.-centric strategy for a very long time. And ultimately, I think that the what happened after 2016, just looking at the country, I think the kind of DC first strategy, I think has, is mostly a lot of people in the party, I think they've realized the folly of that. That said, there are still, you know, habits, you know, are ingrained. And there are a lot of organizations and groups that maybe still think DC first. And, you know, we are part of a movement that is really trying to get people to pivot more to focus on the states. And, you know, it has been heartening to see we've been moving a lot of people who previously didn't care about or know about state legislatures to kind of realize their power. But, you know, it is, it is a process. But, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, people are waking up to it. And there are, you know, and if you look at kind of the political landscape now, Democrats control the White House. They narrowly control Congress. But um, you can see, you know, in all these state governments, there are really impediments to that progress. And you can look at things like... Um, voting laws, for example. And if you look at what happened after the 2020 election, where the I think it was the night of the, the you know, I think it was the night of the third, 
Rick Perry texted uh, Donald Trump and said, you know, just declare victory and have state legislatures throw their electoral votes to you. And that was part of their strategy because they controlled the state legislatures in those states. Um, and so it really shows you that we need to win back state legislatures as a bulwark against tyranny. Exactly. And it's not enough. I know, uh, Melissa, you and I were catching up on the phone the other day, and you made the point that it's not enough for Congress just to pass the voting rights legislation. That That's the big debate in this country right now, uh, with, I believe, it's cinema who's really holding up the filibuster reform needed for that. And because even if they pass, even if Congress passes this legislation, it's the states that have to implement it. And they could slow it down. They could resist it just like they did with Obamacare. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's exactly right. I mean, of course, we hope that this legislation passes and we think it would do a great amount of good. But when you have radically dominated legislatures, they're the ones who are implementing what happens, what's coming down from the federal level. And um, and they can find ways to um, to avoid what they don't want to do and get around certain things. And the ACA is a perfect example because there are still a dozen states who haven't expanded Medicaid. And um, that is, you know, kind of radical right wing non implementation of federal law. So we can see it with that. We can see it with covid um, federal law in terms of covid uh, mandates in terms of things that are happening around that, because it really is when the will of the majority in the legislature is opposed to what the federal law is handing down, they can really slow walk things. And I think that, Aaron, you know a little bit about um, more about what is and is not in that federal law. I think that state legislative districts actually aren't included. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, you know, the law, it would be great um, if it were, if it could pass. But it's not a panacea. And the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, states still have a lot of power over who over kind of the implementation of election laws. And, you know, ultimately what uh, federal laws do is basically they give people a right of action to sue in federal court if they think a state is not abiding those regulations. But the federal government ultimately can't actually run the elections. And so what happens then is, you you know, people are given a right of action and, you know, the courts are, you know, right now incredibly right wing. And so, um, you know, I hope that they would follow the letter of the law, but it's not a guarantee. And then ultimately, and, you know, if, and lawsuits can take a while to, you know, resolve. And so really the most effective way to actually get kind of fairly administered elections and fair districts and making sure everyone can vote, it's ultimately by flipping a state legislature. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And um, so if you could walk us through a recent quote unquote case study, uh, everyone was looking, for instance, at Virginia, the recent elections there as sort of a bellwether for what Democrats can expect in 2022. Obviously, that election night was not so bad because New Jersey broke the curse by holding on to a Democratic governor and and did well with its state government. Um, So what were some lessons in Virginia? Um, How much of a warning sign do you see there for Democrats in 2022? Um, So I would say there were a lot of lessons taken from Virginia. I think one of them was actually that uh, investing in, you know, I know it's kind of counterintuitive because of the result but it really is that investing in state legislative candidates works. And that's because if you look at what happened just in 2017, um, the average uh, Democratic candidate ran about 5% behind the gubernatorial candidate. But if you look at 2021, you know, we endorsed nine candidates and, you know, the median candidate of our endorsees actually ran ahead of the gubernatorial nominee. Um, So that was, you know, like going into election night, The conventional wisdom was, oh, you know, if McAuliffe loses, then we're losing so many seats because there's no way that Democrats can run ahead of the gubernatorial nominee. And then Democrats ran ahead of the gubernatorial nominee. And I think there were certainly issues with the gubernatorial campaign, especially around them. They're actually kind of uh, taking resources from uh, state legislative candidates. And I think one thing we really need to see in 2022, and that I think we will see is gubernatorial nominees who really are understand the importance of having their state legislature, state legislative candidates do well 
and sharing resources with them. Even in spite of the result, investing in state legislative nominee candidates works. We came, you know, if 100 votes had flipped, we the Republicans wouldn't be the majority right now. I mean, it was it was so much closer than the um, gubernatorial campaign. And I, um, I really, I want to put a fine point on that, Aaron, because I think it's incredibly important. We are talking about these types of margins. If a hundred votes had changed hands, Democrats would have control of the House of Delegates in Virginia. A hundred votes. That's the kind of margins that we're working with, and that our, you know, like that our team works on all the time. And honestly, those types of margins give me so much hope because that shift in power is so consequential and it is so close. Yeah, it's excruciating. I mean, I mean so I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to vent for a second. <laughs> Why aren't we seeing more of the governor's race and the state races like in Virginia? Why aren't we seeing more of like a team effort there, like a united front where it's it's up and down the ballot that comes together, strong coordination, um, strong support? Why does it seem so antagonistic, sort of like the central command of D.C. versus the grassroots? Um, you know, I, I think it was that I'm hoping was just a problem particular to uh, the gubernatorial campaign there. Um, we have seen in other states where our gubernatorial nominees really do support the rest of the ticket. But I think that was hopefully just a problem that really was unique to Virginia, where there wasn't that coordination and um, had, again, it was a more D.C. focused strategy. And, you know, I also think that the messaging there. Uh, from the top of the ticket did leave a little bit to be desired in terms of, you know, you can't just talk about Trump all the time. It was an off, off year election in 2022 when federal offices are up, I, you know, maybe Trump becomes more of a factor because of the role that Congress will play in the next election. But in Virginia, it was kind of hard to tie uh, a campaign that was a, a largely about education and prices going up, bringing up Trump all the time. It might help motivate the base a little bit, but it's not really winning as many people over. You need to kind of run on your own record. And to their credit, our candidates, the ones, especially the ones who outran the top of the ticket, they were able to run on their record. They were able to run on things like lowering prescription drug prices. And the candidates who did that outperformed the top of the ticket, which was really more focused on kind of a national message. And so I think the lesson there in Virginia is really, you know, if you have a record to run on, if you can run on the everyday things that can improve people's lives, you can outperform the political environment. Mm -hmm. And Melissa, you've made this point to me before, where when people get together on the grassroots level, on the local level, you're talking about a community of neighbors, and you don't have, you've said this before, where um, when it's Americans talking to Americans, a lot, they share a lot of the same concerns and issues. You've said something along those lines, right? No, absolutely. I mean, I think something that gives me a lot of hope in working in state legislative races is that, you know, these are still local races. These are still neighbor talking to neighbor and a state legislative candidate who knocks on doors in their districts and shows up on people's porches and in their yards and, you know, at their baseball games. Like, those are the people who are going to cut through the national noise. And so, we, um, as an organization, really prioritize candidate door knocking, and that is incredibly important for getting the word out because it is there is a shiny object problem, and it's not just with DC focused groups and maybe even candidates. It's also with voters. <laughs> There's, I mean, I think like the media covers DC. People are paying attention to the the names that they've heard of. And the truth is that they're not seeing as much of the people who are actually influencing their daily lives, which are their state representatives. And so getting people and voters to pay attention to state legislatures is part of the work too. And when you know people join our states project and start a giving circle and start tending to their corners that way with the awareness and the education piece, it can really change things. And again, the candidates who are in these kind of tipping point districts, when they knock on doors, they can absolutely win because they're talking about a water issue in the community, like a particular traffic problem. Like these are issues that all Americans care about and can relate to neighbor to neighbor. So knocking on doors is, of course, 
very effective. Are people doing that in the pandemic? How can that be done safely? So it is being done uh, in Virginia. You know, it was really before the Omicron uh, spread everywhere. So they were able to do it. So, you know, it's standard. You stay six feet apart. Uh, thankfully, when you knock on someone's door, you you are not actually entering their home. You're staying outside. Um, so the risk of transmission is pretty low. Um, one thing we saw in 2020 was that Republicans were uh, knocking doors, going door to door, canvassing, and Democrats largely weren't. And we think a big portion of kind of how the Democratic underperformance in 2020 can be uh, related to that, especially we think among Latino communities. The experts on Latino voting have said not canvassing door to door in 2020 really uh, cost them. And so mask up, stay six feet apart, stay outside when you're canvassing, and you can do it safely. Yeah, I, I absolutely think that's right. I love canvassing. I love it. And I always have interesting conversations and it gives me a lot of hope. I did not do it, obviously, in 2020, but like so many others. But I think in 2022, I will be going back out there and knocking on doors because it's all hands on deck this year. Um, so what are some state races you'll be following closely this year and why? We've already announced that we're going into a few states. Um, one I really want to flag in particular is Michigan, because they actually, for the first time in decades, have you know pretty fair maps in place. And that's because in 2018, they got a ballot initiative in place that implemented a nonpartisan uh, redistricting panel. Now, the maps that the redistricting panel passed, they're still actually, they slightly lean Republican, but only by like a percentage point or two as to like, you know, 8% or something like, like they are today. And so because Michigan has gotten so much fairer maps, there is a real possibility that even in kind of a not great year, the maps, you know, if we can get good candidates and Governor Whitmer can, you know, she t tends to be more popular than uh, President Biden. And so you know, with her leading the ticket, there's a real potential for us to flip uh, a chamber in Michigan. Fantastic. And how can people get involved in these big state races this year? So I want to mention some of our other states too, just so For I can sure, list them out, the ones where we've already started working. Um, do include Michigan, as Aaron said, definitely. Also um, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Maine, and Texas. Those are the states where we're currently kind of on the ground and we'll be adding some more targets. We do a 99 state chamber analysis, which Aaron is actually in charge of, um, and look at where we think there can be meaningful power shifts. And so the way that folks can get involved really is through joining us, um, you know, going to statesproject.org and signing up to follow our newsletter and learn about what we're doing. And of course, I am the head of Giving Circles. And what I hope is that people will, with their communities, uh, start Giving Circles and choose one of these states to support. Because I think it's difficult to figure out when you start realizing how much power state legislatures have, it's like, okay, great. Well, how do I support the candidates that can actually shift power? And how do I figure out where to work in the state? And so that's the type of thing that our research team does um, with great <laughs> precision and um, mind boggling detail. And so that is, you know, kind of what we offer in terms of with giving circles when they choose a state, they're then supporting our program in that state, which focuses on very strategically targeted districts, the districts that we need in order to shift power in the state capital. And the Giving Circles team really does provide a ton of support in terms of how to start a Giving Circle, how to get people involved, sample language, um, ways to reach out and start educating yourself and your community, which was really the journey that I took, was really a self-education journey, then friend by friend by friend by friend, learning about this and starting to understand it. And one thing that I just want to say is that this is a real path to hope because I know that we are seeing incredible doom and gloom in the news and it feels overwhelming. It feels like there's no way we can cut through, you know, the Koch brothers and dark money and all of these efforts to potentially steal 2024. 
which are happening via state legislatures. But the truth is that there is a way to cut through. And the good news about the way to cut through is that it's one seat in each chamber in Arizona, three seats in each chamber in Michigan, 12 seats in the Pennsylvania House with better maps. And I can go on and on, but these these are not many seats that we need. And again, it is often cheaper to change the balance of power in a state chamber than it is to win a single competitive congressional seat. And so we're talking about giving circles that can form and raise $1,000, $10,000 or more. There's no limit, but like have real impact with those types of raises. Something that we sometimes mention is that Sarah Gideon, who ran for the Senate in Maine, ended her campaign with a loss and with $15 million left over, right? And the States Project was the top contributor to defend the Maine State Senate in 2020. And we invested $160,000 and successfully defended a Democratic majority that's done a ton of things for the people of Maine, including, you know, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, raising teacher pay, expanding access to abortion. And that's the kind of comparisons we're looking at and the kind of things that people can get together and learn how to bring attention and resources to something that they care about and something that has real impact on the foundations of our democracy. So um, it has given me such hope to be involved in this and a real path to change and action in a power center that is too often ignored. Um, and sorry, I've been going on for a little no, while. I, I love it. It's <laughs> making on every word. No. Um, so what is a giving circle and how do you get started? And, and how do you choose which state? Like, what? let's say you're in a safe blue state. How do you pick a state to focus on? Like, how, if, if, like walk me through the nuts and bolts. If my friends and I wanted to get together and be like, we're doing a giving circle this year. Like, well, what is that? And how does it work? And how much money do we need to get that started? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what happens is we have, you know, we have a website where you can start a page and then everyone gets their own giving circle page. So it's called something, um, some examples are the Riveters um, or, um, you know, Fighting for Change. Oh, so you come up with like a band name, basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You get your band name. Um, Some folks have a logo or a picture of them up on the pages. And What happens is um, you then kind of gather with people and we have a lot of obviously research and documents and things that you can read about, um, about state legislatures and you can learn as much as you want. But we always say to people, what you really need to know is why did you start this? Why did you decide to do this project with us? Because for a lot of people, it's because of the moment their kid came home after their first lockdown drill or... Um, you know, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a huge moment for giving circles because people suddenly realized, oh my gosh, this is not protected anymore. And we're going to be, choice is not protected anymore. It's going to be decided in the States. I've got to do something about state legislatures. Where can I do that? Um, So there are these emotional moments that bring people to the work. And I always tell people, remember those moments and tell the story of those moments, because that is what's going to get your friends involved. Not Although Aaron does a great job not talking about the Powell memo, that's a good thing to do if you want to, too. But you don't have to learn the history of state legislatures and the radical right takeover if you don't want to. What you have to know is what got you involved. So we kind of encourage people to learn how to story tell their own story of getting involved and then start talking to people. And the truth is that there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of easy action steps to fundraising that I was not aware of. I had never done any fundraising before, but the truth is like it's a math problem. And so if you're like, you know what, I'm going to get together with five of my friends and we're each going to try to raise a thousand dollars for this giving circle. Then that's about asking 25 people for 40 bucks or 40 people for 25 bucks or, you know, 10 people for a hundred bucks. It all depends on what kind of a network you want to build and what you think your network can do. But once you start building that math problem, you'll find that someone who gives 40 bucks is like, Hey, how can I help? And it's like, could you pledge to raise a thousand? Cool. And giving circles start to grow that way. And they start to get to numbers that are incredibly impactful in these races. And the truth is that like watching people do this and recognize how much power they walk with when they walk with their friends and their family in their own network is incredible. Because when you learn the skills of how to bring attention and resources to something that you care about, You can do it for this project. You can do it for your PTA. You can do it for another area of your community. And that type of skill is the type of thing that's going to really corner by corner 
make us all recognize our own power and really tend to democracy. So I'm really inspired by giving circle leaders who take this path with us and keep walking and keep saying like, oh, I hit a part, I'm not sure what to do. And we hand them some more resources and coach them along the way because our real work, we're raising our electoral dollars, of course, to try to change the balance of power in these states, which is so consequential for democracy. But we also want folks to realize that they have the power to plug into this and they are not helpless and they do not have to witness the destruction of their democracy. And this is such a power center to plug into. And again, so much cheaper than trying to impact federal races. And you're not just a drop in the bucket. You are moving the needle with your people in your living room or on Zoom at this moment in time. One thing I want to address uh, is the psychology of fundraising and asking for money. Uh, I had a mentor who helped me with that. Uh, she started her own small business, a media company, and, and was loved, loved raising money, loved asking investors for money. Like She just got so excited over it. Whereas I would go into a panic attack with the idea of asking anyone for money. And so from working with her, just, like, just seeing her enthusiasm really was what set it off. I found my enthusiasm when it came to fundraising. And it's addicting. It's so much fun. And that is what empowered me, little old me, to raise, I kid you not, I'm not making this up, $10 million to make my film. Like I had to rate, I had to go out and ask for that money. And $10 million. And I went, I got rejected from one investor for 1.5 million euros. I came back and asked for 3.5 million euros after retooling my pitch and got it. So what I learned from that whole experience is the whole psychology of raising money, fundraising, is simply throwing an amazing dinner party. If you like to have people over for dinner and you like to think about like, who do you want to invite this night? What are you going to serve? What, do you, what music are you going to play? Candles, all that. That's fundraising. It's about throwing a big party, inviting people in, and you're going to be part of this important event. You're going to be part of this important experience. You're going to be part of this important movement. So everyone has to understand that. Asking for money and fundraising, and it's about like, come join me on, on this party. Come join me in this experience. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have so much fun. It's going to change lives. It's going to change the conversation. Let's all be a part of it. That's what you're doing. You're throwing an incredible dinner party for, with, with your friends and meeting new friends along the way. That's what fundraising is. I love that so much. And, you know, I will add that when I started, um, when I paused on writing teen novels and started consulting with the States Project, I had been doing it for a couple of months before someone said to me like, oh, how's the fundraising gig going? And I was like, what? I'm, I'm flipping state legislatures. Exactly. Yeah. And they were like, through fundraising, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, I think I'm fundraising. <laughs> it is that like every time I walked into a room, the way that I walked in was like, I'm about to tell you something, a way that you can have a political impact that you had no idea you could have. And I'm, I, I know everyone's looking for that right now. So you're welcome. Like, that's what I felt like. I was like, I'm bringing value to you and offering you a way to join this hugely impactful movement. And I really had never thought of it as fundraising. And you're right that like the psychology of doing it that way of saying, I'm bringing you something of value, you know, like is, is incredible. And people really meet you there when you mm -hmm. enter with that kind of energy. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly right. Fundraising is all about joining together in something greater and it just lifts the vibe in you and them and, and in the, and that spreads. And that's what we need right now um, for this whole country. <laughs> Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Razum for Ukraine at Razum, R A Z O M, for Ukraine.org. That's Razum for Ukraine.org. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. 
And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Visenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Oh, and by the way, if you don't hear your name in this list and you've signed up, we're going to say your name starting in July and keep it going for however long you donated. FYI. <laughs> so we want to thank Eric Coffin. Jess Sauer. Chick Quinn. Lily Wachowski. Megan McNerney. Sean Rubin. Todd S. Perlstein. Pat. Kenny Main. John Schoenthaler. Frank Jaquette. Ellen McGurk. Joel Ferran. Larry Gasson. Erica Moore. Karen A. Deal. Nico Phillips. Brian E. Castor. Andrea or Andrea Scalzo. Tatiana Bursch. Karen Heisler. Jordan Sanders. Ann Bertino. Chris Bravo. T.R. Dunstan. John Millett. David East. Stu. Shannon Nacy. Ida. Chris Fellow. Ben Wheaton. Joseph Mara Jr. Rich Halcomb. Thomas Scheibe. Kelsey Malsom. Julie Matthews. Meganopolis. Mark Mark. Barbara Kittredge. Matthew Womack. Silas Frank. Sean Berg. Kristen Custer. Tracy Ash. Benjamin Galuza. Kai Gillis. Sharon Hatrick. Irv Robinson. William Barry Reeves. Richard Smith. Emmy. Kevin Gannon. Yvonne Q. Mike Christensen. Sandra Collins. Katie Masuris. John Laughlin. Jeff Thompson. James D. Leonard. Leo Chalupa. <laughs> Carol Golstad. Michael Woldridge. <laughs> Crimer, no criming. Jason Benke. Joe Darcy. Ann Marshall. Jeremy Lewis. Joel Newman. Trigve. Christine M. D.L. Singfield. Matt Perez. Nicole Spear. Brian to Juden. Maureen Murphy. Michelle Dash. Abby Road. Jans Alstrup Rasmussen. Victoria Olson. Alabama. ZW. Lisa LaFlame. Jason Bainbridge. Sarah Gray. Mike Tripico. Diana Gallagher. Jennifer Ann Luter. John Ripley. Ethan Mann. Piet Yitzma. David Porter. Kate Cotton. Kim Mellon. Leah Campbell. Lynn Schneider. Jared Lombardo. Karen Humphreys. Eric Kaplan. Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you. Thank you.